Hey everyone, glad that you were able to join me and I trust that what we have to share in this video will be a blessing to you. It is the 16th of May, it's the 51st day of our lockdown here in South Africa and in this video I'd like to start by sharing a story with you that I believe has significant meaning for us in this particular time. It's about a blind man that was taken often down to a little village called Bethsaida. He didn't actually live there, but apparently his relatives and friends used to take him down to Bethsaida. And um, he would then go and sit in a particular position, waiting, begging for whatever he was given by the passers-by. Now, if you put yourself in his shoes, you can well imagine being a blind man he would not be able to see anything but only hear the donkeys walking past, the bleating of goats, the chatter of people, and the general hustle and bustle of this little town. But on a particular day, he suddenly heard familiar voices, and they were the excited voices of his friends and relatives because they had heard that Jesus was coming to that village. So they went to the blind man and they took him to Jesus, and they begged Jesus to heal his blindness. Now we know from previous miracles, uh, Jesus could easily have said to him, Son, receive your sight. And he would have been miraculously healed. We know that that is a possibility. But on this occasion, and this is why I believe this story is so applicable to us, Jesus did something quite different. And as that blind man stood there listening to this conversation and the excitement and animation in his friend's uh, and relatives as they were begging Jesus to heal him, suddenly he would have felt the strong hand uh, of the Lord taking hold of his hand. And Jesus led him right out of the village, away from all the hustle and bustle, to a private place. And there in this private place, with just the Lord Jesus and this blind man, Jesus began to address his situation. While they were absolutely on their own, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, spending this time, personal time with this man, Jesus takes saliva, rubs it on his eyelids and says, what do you see? As the man opens his eyes, light floods his, his brain and his heart for the first time. And he says, I see men as trees walking. And so Jesus then reached out and touched him once again and his eyes opened and he could see. What an amazing miracle. What a wonderful experience for this man. I'm sure that for the rest of his life, he would have told the story how the very son of God, the, uh, the Messiah who had come to him, taken his hand, led him out of the village alone and there alone had ministered to his need and opened his eyes that he might see. I believe the story has uh, got a wonderful lesson for us, and I believe it's applicable for our time. And I do believe that Jesus wants to take your hand and lead you away from all the hustle and bustle, the anxiety, the stress of this life, into a private place where he can begin to minister to your need. I do believe that <clears throat> while we may have a lot of knowledge of scripture and a knowledge of the Lord, there is to some degree a blindness in our heart. Perhaps we're only seeing partially um, and we need to have a one-on-one -on -one with the Lord Jesus and allow him to counsel us and to minister to us. This is the counsel of the Lord Jesus. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. I believe that he wants to take our experiences, our trials, our difficulties, our sorrows, our, our griefs, our failures, the things that we regret. He wants to take all of those and use them as a molding tool to, to bring to us the, the gold that comes from him. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And only the Lord Jesus in this one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship with him as we open our hearts to him, he can then 
make us rich, as he says. And he also wants to give us white garments that we might be clothed and that the shame of our nakedness may not be revealed. And he wants to anoint our eyes with eye salve that we may see. May we spend this time in the presence of the Lord, opening our hearts to him. I do believe that many of us um, have spent time in, in meetings, in Bible studies, in breaking of bread, in various meetings, which are, are blessed and wonderful. We've also perhaps watched many YouTube ministries that enrich us and help us to understand the word of God better. But this a time alone with the Lord is absolutely vital for us. So I'd like to just take a deeper and a closer look in, in a very practical way of what I've called behind your bedroom door. I do believe the Lord is calling us to come alone with him into a private place where he can begin to speak to us. Uh, we know the scripture tells us that every single one of us will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for the things that we have done in our body, whether they're good or bad. And Paul adds in that very same verse, he says, and knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And you know, it might be a terrifying thing for us to, to realize that every single one of us will have to stand before the Lord. We will have no excuses to offer. We will be stripped completely naked and everything that we have done, uh, we will have to give an account for, which could be a very daunting and, and frightening experience knowing the terror of the Lord. But I do believe that the Lord is giving us this opportunity. Let us draw near to him and stand before him now one-on-one -on -one, and allow him to search our hearts. <clears throat> We've said in, in previous um, videos that there is an invisible realm where the throne of God is, where the angels are, where Jesus sits at the right hand of God. This is the eternal invisible realm. And in that is the visible realm in which we live. We live and move and have our being in God. And in the, in the beginning, as we've also said before, the, the Garden of Eden, which is known as the Mountain of God or the Garden of God, was where heaven and earth came together. And um, Adam and Eve had a very free and easy re uh, recourse and relationship with the, the invisible God, with the angels in, in their presence. And so it was a wonderful experience for them until sin entered in and that broke that whole glorious relationship and God put them out of the garden. But in the wilderness, God once again instructed Moses to have the tabernacle built and the glory of God came and God once again lived amongst his people, but in the tabernacle under limitations and restriction. Then when they moved into the promised land, eventually God said, where I put my name, that's where you worship me. And so Solomon built the temple and the glory of God came into the temple once he had dedicated it. And that's where the presence of God was. That's where heaven and earth came together in the temple in Jerusalem. But once we moved into the New Testament era, uh, this all changed. There was a new temple and the new temple at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was in fact the body of Christ. The, the body of believers is where God comes to dwell. We know that the scripture says God dwells in the praises of his people. So in, in fellowship with other believers in the body of Christ, that's where heaven and earth come together and the Lord is able to minister to us in a particular way. There is also a need for us to recognize that we can come before the Lord on our own and this is where heaven and earth can meet together right in our own hearts and in our own bodies because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as we come before the Lord on this in this personal way and meet with him, we should open ourselves to him and say, Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It is far better for us at this time, 
while we still have opportunity to come before the Lord and let him judge us, let him expose us, let him shine his light into the deepest crevices of our hearts so that he can deal with our blindness, deal with our shortcomings and minister to us. This is where it it really takes place. In a meeting while we're listening to wonderful ministry, we can be informed, we can be blessed, we can receive revelation, but it's only in this quiet, private place as we meet with the Lord, this is where the work really gets done. This is where he can pour out his grace into our hearts and minister to us in a very real and wonderful way. <clears throat> it says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So there is nothing that we can hide. Uh, let everything be exposed before the Lord because it's far better to, for it to be exposed now than when we stand before him on that day. Moreover, and this is what David had to say in Psalm 19, and he's talking about the word of God. He says, moreover, by them, the word of God, your servant is warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. In keeping the word of God, obeying his commandments, there is great reward. He says, who can understand his errors? Uh, we don't have to psychologically analyze and find excuses as to why we are like we are, why we have the weaknesses we have. All we have to do is bring them to the Lord. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. The things that may be going on in our minds and our hearts, there may be bitterness, there may be unforgiveness, there may be um, selfish, selfish ambitions, lusts, desires, things that come into our hearts, jealousies. Let us expose these to the light, to the Lord, and let him deal with them. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. They don't have to, because Jesus has paid the price. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgressions. How wonderful to be innocent. Because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as much as the word of God may expose our nakedness, expose our shortcomings and our blindness, the word of God also makes a provision that our sins can be forgiven. Let us take, by faith, take a hold of these wonderful truths. And as we spend time in the presence of God, ask him to apply this to your life and to my life. Lord, forgive, cleanse, wash me uh, of all unrighteousness. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's a, a reality that we need to take a hold of and apply to our lives. Lord, give me the grace that I might be the righteousness of God in Christ because Jesus has taken my transgressions. In Romans we're told, But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. So even David foresaw this. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So right now, before we pass away and pass into the presence of God and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, we can stand before him now and enjoy the wonderful blessing that he provides in Christ. And, and as David said, blessed is the man to whom God does not impute sin, but imputes righteousness without works. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. God understands and he's wanting and he's willing to minister to us. The Father is seeking such to worship him in spirit and in truth. And as Jesus also told us, seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be given to you. Knock and the door shall be opened. 
God is more willing to draw near to us than we are willing to draw near to him. <clears throat> and now as John tells us, and now little children abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So the, the more time we can spend alone with the Lord, the more confident we can be that when he comes, we'll stand before him without shame, without fear, but with boldness and with confidence, we will be able to face him. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of the mind. It is not necessary for us to allow our past, to allow the opinions of others, the futility of our um, thoughts of condemnation to draw us and drag us down. That's what Paul is saying. <clears throat> but that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So let's look at this one as well. Put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Uh, you can sit in a hundred Bible studies and not have this experience. You can have this knowledge and be aware of it, but not experience it. As we come before the Lord on a one-to-one -one basis in our in our private moment with the Lord, in fellowship with him, we can take this verse and say, Lord, here is what your word says. I need to put on the new man, which was renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him, Jesus Christ, who created him. Now, Lord, I'm coming to you. Give me the grace. Give me the wherewithal. By your power, by your spirit, put this new man upon me. Renew my knowledge renew my heart that I might be absolutely new and f and find a freshness and a clarity in my heart as I spend time with you. John goes on to tell us, whosoever abides in him does not sin. Whosoever sins has neither seen him, talking of the blindness, nor known him. So if we continue in sin and allow these things to drag on, it, it, it blinds us. And it causes us to be uh, drawn away from the Lord. A lukewarmness can enter in. And so coming before him like this and spending time opening our hearts, letting him expose us, letting him deal with our blindness, this is really what does it. So he says, let no man deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. So God's grace will enable us. His mercy will is what we need for forgiveness. But his grace doesn't overlook sin. His grace enables us to not sin. So this is what I'm saying. As we spend time in his presence, we're drawing on him, his grace, his power, his spirit, to free us that we may walk before him with a clear conscience. And you know, once that happens, as I'm sure we've all experienced, there is a lightness in our step. There's a joy. There's a clarity. There's a peace that he floods our hearts with, a peace that the world cannot give us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We begin to love the Lord and love one another with a supernatural love. Um, it's a time when we can rejoice in him. So as we spend time in his presence like this, you'll find that the this great liberty, this great uh, being set free, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. And we can then spend time singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord, speaking in tongues, because Paul tells us that when we speak in another tongue, we're speaking to God and not to men. And our spirit is praying and we're edified. So we can spend time being edified in the spirit as we lift up our heart and, and speak to him in another tongue. Rejoice in him, sing in tongues, sing with the spirit, sing with the understanding and rejoice in the Lord for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And really our walk with him is an exciting, glorious, wonderful uh, walk because he, he helps us to overcome the weakness of our flesh. He helps us to overcome the temptations of sin and he causes us to triumph. And this is where we find it in the presence of the Lord. So if our vision of him, our spiritual vision, 
has been blurred so that we see men as trees walking. Let's allow him to touch us again so that our vision may be clear. Our spiritual eyes might be opened. And as Paul says, uh, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But he is revealing these things to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches the deep things of God and shows them to us. So may we have our eyes open to begin to know those deep things of God. As the Lord Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will take the things of mine and show them to you. He will also show you things to come. May we be enriched by our relationship, a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. You know, as we're enriched in this way individually, as we come together, when lockdown is finished and we're able to gather once again, we bring this richness into the fellowship, into the body of Christ, and we enjoy collectively uh, being the very temple of God where the Spirit of God dwells and the joy of the Lord is our strength. May God bless you richly. Amen.